Welcome to Oil and Gas Law with Energy Law Prof. Today we'll talk about the secondary term and production in pain quantities. So we know that the typical habendum clause says that the oil and gas company, the lessee, gets to keep that lease as long thereafter as oil and gas or other minerals are produced. Now what we'll see is that doesn't literally mean that if you just have a tiny trickle of oil and gas, that will be sufficient to keep the lease. And typically what is required is pain quantity. So you have to have enough oil and gas being produced on that lease that it's in paying quantities. We'll see the different way that that is defined by the courts. Uh, and we'll just consider what it takes to maintain the lease during that secondary term. Now, last time we looked at what it takes to maintain the lease during the primary term. Now we'll talk about what it main, means to maintain the lease during the secondary term. What does it mean to have production? What does it mean to have production in paying quantities? And in future classes, we'll consider constructive production. So situations where there's not literally production on the lease, but there's something else that we construe as production that counts as production. That will be for later lessons. All right, our first case is Stanilin versus Barnhill. This is a case from Texas from 1937, and it's on page 225 in that eighth edition low textbook. In this case, there's a five-year primary term. The lessee, Stanilin, the oil and gas company, found sour gas. Remember, sour gas is gas typically with impurities like sulfur in it, and they didn't produce that until a market appeared in 1935. By that time, the primary term was over. Now the appellees, the lessor, the landowner, during the primary tier term file an affidavit of non-production just to uh, document that there is not production on the lease. They are not selling gas from the lease. Now, if you're an oil and gas company, if your landowner does this, your less owner does this, you might be in trouble. And in fact, the court here says the lease ceased to exist at the end of the term. Now, you might ask, well, look, there was obviously a well here that could produce gas. Shouldn't that be enough to maintain the lease into the secondary term? Because as soon as a market was available in 1935, they ended up selling that gas. But the rule in Texas is no. You have to have literal production from the well. And so if all you have is a well that's capable of production, but you don't have a market to sell it, the lease will end. And that's what the standalone case stands for. Okay, that's the majority view. So you, here's a good statement of it from the standalone case. If within five years, the appellants have developed and produced in paying quantities, their interest in the estate continues. On the other hand, According to the lease, if oil and gas is not produced, then the lease comes to an end. So since the lease says it's only maintained as long as oil and gas is produced, if it's not produced and sold, the lease end. Terminates, no act on the part of the lessor is necessary in order to accomplish this result. Okay, that's the majority view. As we often do in this class, we're going to contrast the Texas view with the Oklahoma view. And the Oklahoma view is stated in Pack versus Santa Fe Minerals. It's a 1994 case. It's on page 228 in your text. In that case, the lessees, the oil and gas companies, had a gas well again. But this time, they shut it in for longer than the 60-day cessation of production clause would allow. As we'll see, cessation of production clause allows a temporary stoppage but they, longer, they shut it for longer than that would allow. So why are they doing that in this case? Well, the basic reason is that they're doing it because they are waiting for higher prices later in the season. So unlike oil prices, which tend to move relatively unpredictably, you're not very often going to shut it in and wait for higher oil prices because oil prices just aren't that predictable, natural gas prices tend to have seasonal variation. So often they are higher in the winter time when more natural gas is needed for heating homes and also maybe for producing electricity to heat homes. And so the producer here says, you know what, I'm just going to shut it in during this period of low prices and wait for higher prices. So the court considers, well, literally, there is not production at this time. Does that mean that the secondary term has expired? And what the court says, no, it doesn't automatically expire. The court says having a well that's capable of production is enough. And the reason for this is, look, the lessor and the lessee 
in a sense, share the same interest in increased prices in the future. Because if the lessee, oil and gas company, is getting paid more for its natural gas, that means the royalty that's paid to the lessor, that one-eighth of production, will be bigger as well. And so the court says, look, this is cooperative. There's no reason for the lessee oil and gas company to uh, shut this well in just to harm the lessor. In fact, it benefits both parties, and so it should be allowed. Now note, again, under Stanilin, the Texas rule, it would literally not be produced, and so therefore uh, production would stop and the lease would stop. Now, over time, we've developed a little bit better technology for actually addressing some of this so that often oil and gas companies can actually, instead of completely stopping production, they can kind of choke back production during periods of low prices. And this is a chart from an article, Bloomberg article, that actually talks about this issue. And what you're basically seeing here is that in this later years, in 2016 and 2017, uh, what you're seeing is that as the price of natural gas increased in blue here, you can see that the amount of natural gas produced in white increased. And in fact, as the price of natural gas fell, it fell as well. And that's because the uh, oil and gas producers are able to kind of choke back their natural gas production a little bit and expand it a little bit. And as long as it doesn't stop, then you don't really face this Staniland and PAC problem. What happens when there's no natural gas production on the lease? Does that maintain it? Okay, so the majority rule, the Texas rule is to maintain the lease, you need to actually produce and market natural gas from the lease. That's the rule in Texas, it's the rule in Ohio, it's the rule in Kansas and Louisiana. The minority rule, which we see in Oklahoma, is that the well just has to be capable of production and that's enough to maintain the lease. There are also uh, some states that follow a hybrid rule where if you have an oil, it has to be uh, sold to maintain the lease, but with natural gas, you can just have a well that's capable of production. That hybrid rule really functions more like the minority rule because the reality is you're probably not going to want to shut in an oil well anyway because you can't count on higher prices in the future. All right, one clause that we've talked about a little bit in the past and we'll talk about more in the future is a shut-in royalty clause. And what that allows the oil and gas company to do is shut in the well and to make a small payment to the landowner to maintain the lease. Now, think about how that has a different function in a state like Texas versus a state like Oklahoma. Think about how the default rule there makes the shut-in royalty a little bit different. In Texas, that shut-in royalty protects the lessee, the oil and gas company, because without that shut-in royalty payment that are sort of artificially maintains the lease the default rule is if you shut in the well you lose the lease all right in oklahoma that shut in royalty payment provides a little protection to the landowner because the default rule is that the oil and gas company can just shut in that well and wait for higher prices but the shut in royalty clause will say when you do that you have to make a little payment to the landowner so there's actually a little protection from the landowner in the shut in royalty case with the states like Oklahoma that follow that minority rule. All right, now let's talk about a different situation where we often question whether there's production and paying quantities. And this can happen a lot. This is where you have an old oil and gas well or a couple oil and gas wells on a lease. And over time, their production has fallen lower and lower and lower. Now, in that circumstance, Often, the lessor, the landowner, wants the oil and gas company off the lease. But often, the lessee oil and gas company wants to maintain the lease. Well, why is that? Why does the lessee want to keep a lease where there's very little production and maybe it's unprofitable to continue producing? Well, that's because, as we've talked about before, oil and gas companies view every lease as a potential lottery ticket because there may be more oil and gas on that property. If they can maintain it by just keeping one well, which will maintain that secondary term because oil and gas is still 
being produced, that's great because if later more oil and gas is found in that region at a different depth or because there's a new method of producing oil and gas, they can all of a sudden get all that new oil and gas from that lease that they have maintained. And better yet, that lease, which was signed a long time in the past, may have particularly advantageous terms for the oil and gas company. Think about it this way. Royalties for decades and decades were always one eighth. Nowadays, they can be much higher. So instead of one eighth, which is 12.5%, they might be 25%, twice as big, or 30% or 40%. So that lease where the oil and gas company just has to pay 12.5% to the landowner is potentially very valuable if new oil and gas is discovered on that property. Okay, by the same token, the oil and gas uh, owner, the lessor, the landowner, wants to have a new opportunity to lease that property. They might want to have a new opportunity for several reasons. One is they get a new bonus. Second is maybe they can choose their oil and gas company if they don't like their current one. And the third is they can maybe get a much bigger royalty because the royalties have gone up over time. So this is a huge dollar issue for the oil and gas company and the landowner. Now, let's look at the legal uh, test that the courts use to determine whether oil and gas is still being produced when you just have a little bit being produced from a lease. Okay. The lessors say that the lease wasn't producing in paying quantities. Now, why does it matter if it's producing in paying quantities? Well, that's because the courts typically define producing to mean producing in paying quantities. So just a trickle of oil and gas isn't going to suffice. It has to be producing in paying quantities. What does producing in paying quantities mean? Well, basically it means that the well is profitable for an oil and gas company to operate. But we'll see that there's a lot of subtleties to that definition. We'll see how the courts define it. So the lessors say, look, if you look at the income from this well, for a period just over a year, from June 1955 to September 1956, there was only $3,250 of oil going to the oil and gas company. If you look at their expenditures to operate that well, they spent $3,466. So they were actually losing money on this well for this period over a year. So it's not profitable. Okay, problem is the oil and gas company came in just after that and reworked the well, which is, you know, can mean a lot of different things, but it's basically just efforts on that single well to try and increase its production. You can clean out the well, you could frack the well, you could, you know, complete it to a slightly different area by drilling a little bit deeper to a slightly different formation. There's a lot of different ways to rework the well, change the amount of pumping or the kind of pumping that is done. And when they did that, production increased 18 times over. So this well, which was basically unprofitable for a year, became extremely profitable. And so you can see why these fights over production and paying quantities are such high stakes. For the oil and gas company, they can have a lottery ticket if they're able to rework this and get to produce a whole bunch of oil under this old lease. They don't have to pay a bonus. They have that old level of royalty. Whereas for the landowner, if they could end the lease, get a new bonus and get all this production covered under a new royalty that would give them a much bigger share, that can be worth a lot of money. So what is the, what is the test that the court uses? Well, the test is a two-part test. One, it says, does the well have a net profit over a reasonable period of time? If it doesn't, then they do a second part of the test, which says, is there a reasonable basis for expecting profit? Now, these two parts of the test are typically called the litmus test and the legal test. And the litmus test is just about profitability. Have those operating revenues been greater than the operating costs over a reasonable period of time? If not, if you can find a period of time, typically over a year, where the well has been unprofitable, then you apply the legal test. And the legal test is, would a reasonably prudent operator who is motivated by profit and not by speculation, nonetheless continue to operate the lease in the manner in which it's being operated? Okay, what does that mean? Uh, so what does it mean to be motivated by profit and not by speculation? I think what we're thinking about is, you know, we don't want the oil and gas company just to hold on to all its properties, even though it's really not getting anything from those properties 
on the hope that maybe one of them will be that lottery ticket that will make them a lot of money. If that's all they're doing, they should give the land back to the landowner. The landowner maybe doesn't want to produce oil and gas anymore, or it can lease it to another oil and gas operator that's really willing to develop it. On the other hand, if the oil and gas company is working on it and has a plan to produce profit from that lease, well, maybe then it's operating as a reasonably prudent operator. Now, this can be very hard to judge because to say it's, by pro it's for profit and not for speculation, there's clearly not a bright line between those two things. In fact, I don't know if any of you, you know, speculate on cryptocurrency or on robin hood but if you're speculating typically you're doing so for profit so it's kind of hard to distinguish what's profit and what is speculation and for this reason a lot of these cases go to the jury these high stakes cases uh, you can have a lot of lawyers spending time trying to convince a jury that it's on one side of the line versus on the other all right so this in paying quantities test some leases specifically require production in paying quantities, but even if they don't, that's gonna be implied in most states. Now, some states use a slightly different standard for what amount of production is required. So uh, some of the different standards that can, can be used, one is, well, what would be a lessee's subjective view? So for the oil and gas company, are they really intending to produce this because they believe they'll get profit for, from it? Um, or is this a bad faith effort just to hold on to the land? An objective standard would say, well, what does a reasonably prudent operator do? You see, we have uh, often the Texas standard looks more like that. And then there's a third standard that's sometimes used, which is, is the production and the royalty from it sufficient to compensate the lessor? Is that royalty enough to basically make it worthwhile to keep holding on to that lessor's land? Now, the majority view is similar to the view that you see in Texas. So you have operating revenues have to be bigger than uh, operating costs for a reasonable period of time. And if they're not, um, then we go on to that legal test about profit versus speculation. Now, how do you define operating revenues and operating costs? Typically, the operating revenues are the sales of oil and gas that are attributable to the working interest. That means to the oil and gas companies, uh, in other words, all the production minus what's paid to the landowner uh, or actually owner of a um, non-participating royalty. Okay, the, we'll talk about non-participating royalties much more later in the class. Now, the operating costs are the actual and direct costs of producing and marketing the well. So anything that the oil and gas company spends, you know, pumping the well, sending people out there uh, for maintenance, etc. On the other hand, things that happen at the start, like all the money that was spent to drill the well, and at the end, like cleanup, etc., often can be excluded. Because the idea is, well, look, as long as the well is producing net positive money, I've already spent the money on the front end and I know I'm gonna to have to spend the money on the back end. So when you consider whether I'm doing this for profit, you should just think about my costs right now for the well and how much money right now the well is giving me. All right, now when we consider what's a reasonable period of time to determine if the well is profitable, typically we need to think about a reasonable period of time and that can be defined variously by courts, but usually, usually it's at least a year. And you see this in the Clifton case where it is just over a year. 